Now, next up, the Treasurer, Josh Frydenberg, and while he joins us, here's Scott Morrison reacting to the anti-Semitic attack on one of the Treasurer's election advertisements. These have been attacks on our candidates. If there's anyone out there, any parties or any people who have any knowledge about this, this isn't about politics, this is about crimes and hate. And I would encourage you to cooperate with authorities with their very genuine investigations here, because this should have no, no place in our elections. Absolutely no place. Treasurer, good morning. Welcome. Nice to be with you, Barry. Why has this campaign become so ugly? Well, I think it has become more toxic and coarse, the political debate. Uh, social media is contributing to that with everyone having a megaphone. But there are also people in our community with quite abhorrent views. Now, yesterday's vandalism of my posters uh, was not only a criminal and cowardly act, it was an insult to all the victims of the Holocaust and to every Australian serviceman and woman who served in our armed forces against tyranny. And we need to have a debate about ideas and about people's words and actions, but we can't sanction or green light such intolerant views. Yeah, and you mentioned social media, but the upside to that is that we're, we're actually discovering what people really think. And on your side of politics, Islamophobes have gotten through the system. On Labor's side, in, in, in the case of the Northern Territory, there was an anti-Semitic comment that the system is allowing these people to get through. Well, I think you're right. It's, we've seen it on all parties and across all states. Uh, but these views, when they've become known uh, to our party officials, we've acted very swiftly because if you have these abhorrent views, you have no place in the Liberal Party. Yeah, but I wonder, though, it's, it, you, you act when you hear about it. But how do they get through the system in the first place? Like you take the case of Peter Killen and the Liberal Party in Victoria, who, by his own admission, wants to prevent gays from getting elected to the parliament. How does somebody like that get pre-selected in the first place? Well, there is due diligence done, but quite clearly, uh, after, the after, well, after the election, there's always a review of the procedures uh, that uh, take place in respect to these things. It's done by the organisational wing, and that will be the same case after this election. This guy also said that he, um, his, his aim was to infiltrate and influence. Now, people used to join a party once, now they infiltrate it. I mean, what is going on in, in the Victorian branch of the party when you've got these people who seem to be from the extreme right, and yet, on the other hand, your party is aggressively recruiting some of these people? Well, I don't accept the premise of that question, Barry. We're not aggressively... What part of it that you Well, not? We're, not, we're not aggressively uh, seeking to recruit people with uh, extremist views, far from it. In fact, the Liberal Party that I joined, that I'm a member, that I'm proud to be its deputy and that Scott Morrison is proud to be its leader of, uh, we are tolerant. Uh, we stand up for, for people who, who, who don't necessarily have a voice and those views expressed by some individuals have no place in our party. Well, there are people in your party that's, that are saying that you're going out and you're recruiting people from some of the churches and their views are quite extreme. Well, I mean, if people are religious uh, and those views uh, that they have uh, accord with their religion and they want to express them and they're legal, then so be it. But we don't want people with extremist views in our party. We don't sanction these views. And as I pointed out earlier, uh, we've seen issues such as this be raised across states uh, and across parties, and the Labor Party has no place to lecture us, given the views of some of their comments, that are, some of their uh, candidates mm -hmm. that have been disendorsed. Yeah. Now, there's a case of Neil Erickson. Now, you don't get further to the right than him, you know, in terms of extremism. And there's a story this morning that he, he put out a videotape, 11 minutes of it, where he says that he that he went to a, to a meeting, an LMP unofficial meeting, on the Gold Coast last year, and the whole aim of that was, was to recruit people from the right to try and take control of the LNP for moderates. Well, I saw that the LNP official who was actually speaking at the event has said that those views of Ericsson are appalling. Uh, he didn't know that he was going to be at that event and clearly that event wasn't designed for that purpose that Ericsson is claiming. You know, one of your closest friends in politics is Ed Husick, right? Mm -hmm. Two things, he's a Muslim yeah. and he's on the Labor side of politics. I mean, is there something that... that two people like you could do, get together and try and sort something out about some of these racist attitudes that prevail on both sides? Oh, well, we talk regularly about the toxicity of, of modern politics, uh, but uh, Ed uh, is a good person who stands up against racism just like I do, just as uh, our leaders do. And I think it's really important that we be eternally vigilant because, as you know, that's the price of liberty. Mm. After the Victorian election, you said that it was a wake-up call. Mm-hmm. 
when you woke up, <laughs> what was the message and what have you done about it? Oh, well, we're communicating our economic plan to the, the, uh, to the community within Victoria. That, was that the wake up call? Well, that you I think, better communicate. Well, I think, I think that was part of it, actually. Um, I, I think we've got a very strong message. State and federal issues are different. The results at both the state level and the federal level in Victoria have also been uh, different in recent elections. But the clear message that Scott Morrison and I and our entire team are communicating to the Australian people is that there is a clear choice at this election between Bill Shorten and his higher taxes uh, and the coalition and with his lower taxes and the focus that we have on delivering essential services. Was one of the messages though about climate change, that you hadn't given enough attention, you weren't doing enough around climate change. You're up against two people in your electorate, both of them putting climate change number one. What, what's, what message are you getting on that issue? Well, it's an important issue in my electorate. It's an important issue for the country. That's why we take our Paris commitments seriously. That's why we will beat our 2030 target, just as we have beaten our original Kyoto target on track to beat our 2020 target. We've got $25 billion of renewable investment currently underway in Australia, a record amount. We're one of the most attractive destinations in the world for renewable energy. We're also investing in Snowy 2.0 to become the big battery on the east coast of Australia. But you shouldn't see climate climate change is a zero-sum game, is a binary choice between doing something and doing nothing. We're taking action. But what Bill Shorten has failed to do is come up with realistic targets, costed policies and practical solutions. And he has yeah. been very... But he, Barry, has um, been very tricky. Uh, he has uh, failed to answer the, the obvious question 63 times, what is the cost to the economy but of see, policy? Maybe you shouldn't focus on the cost, uh, necessarily on the cost either, as, as, as the, the key issue here, uh, because you, you leave an impression that, that the cost of change prevents change itself. But you've got the biggest energy user in the country, Tomago Aluminium Smelter, with a, more than a thousand blue collar workers who says there's not enough detail about Bill Shorten's policy. Now, if the biggest energy user in the country says Bill Shorten hasn't provided enough detail, what hope do 10 million households and 3 million small businesses have? And I think that's the key point here. He, Bill Shorten says it's not going to have any cost. And the reason why he says it's not going to have any cost is because he's not going to pay the bill. The Australian people will. And that w is where he has an obligation. 500,000 people have already voted in this election and they're doing so without Bill Shorten coming clean about the true cost to the economy of his electricity tax. All right, let's talk about franking credits. Australia is the only country in the world that does this, that we give cash handouts, refunds, to shareholders who pay no tax. How is it that Australia alone regards this as affordable, desirable and sustainable? We also have one of the highest company tax rates and that's it's in relation to company tax rates. This and is not a benefit to the companies, it's a benefit but, to the shareholders. Okay, well let me ex explain a few things. Firstly, um, the companies have always paid tax on behalf of the shareholders mm -hmm. and they pay it at 30%. And where the shareholders have a marginal rate of tax under 30%, they get a cash refund. When they have a, a marginal tax rate above 30%, they pay extra. Now, Bill Shorten and the Labor Party took this policy to previous elections. They've supported it, saying that it will help retirees and lower income earners. Now, in a desperate cash grab, uh, focusing on the political week, they have sought to raise $57 billion out of these retirees who have done nothing wrong but simply diligently save for their own retirement. If you started over again, and I think this is the key question, if you started over again and you've got $6 billion to spend, would you spend it on these franking credits or would you spend it making childcare more affordable? Well, this is a critical part of our tax system. I mean, by Bill Shorten changing the dividend imputation scheme, uh, you've got people like Professor, uh, Professor Bignall Walden, who is a formerly a director of the OECD and a professor at Sydney University, who says this will change the way capital is formed in this country. There will be now an incentive under Labor's policy for people not to invest in Australian companies, but to invest offshore. So there are a lot of real serious economic consequences of Labor's policy. So the answer to that is, even with the benefit of hindsight, if you started all over again, you would still spend $6 billion giving this handout to shareholders rather than make childcare more it, affordable. See, you're making the fundamental mistake, Barry. It's not a handout. The shareholders own the company and... It's a refund. Well, it's a refund. Right, so you in would relation stick with to that their refund rather than 
make childcare more affordable. Well, what we have done in the budget is set out an alternative path to economic responsibility. No, but th this is a clear choice. But this... you two, both sides say that this election is a clear choice. This is not hypothetical. This is the clear choice that Labor offers now, right? And you're saying that even if you started over again, you would stick with the current policy and not put the money into child. Well, we're saying we can provide lower taxes and uh, franking credits and record funding on childcare and other essential services, whereas the Labor Party have decided to go to the route of higher taxes without actually explaining the subsequent consequential impact on the economy of $387 billion of taxes. So everything that we laid out in the budget, guaranteeing the essential services, $100 billion on infrastructure spending, tax cuts for those earning under $126,000 and 80,000 new apprentices was all done without increasing taxes. Are you comfortable with, uh, with the, um, your party giving preferences to Clive Palmer, given that he owes his workers $7 million, still owes them, he says that he put money in a trust account, but the money still... He owes the Commonwealth about $60 million plus. He faces criminal charges. Is he a fit and proper person to sit in the Senate? Well, as the Prime Minister has said, everyone needs to pay their debts and those issues are being pursued. And he the hasn't. And, and in the meantime, you've given him your preferences. But in this country, uh, unless people are in jail, they can run for office. And the yes, but and they the don't all get the support of a major party. And because of the support that you're giving him, he could sit in the, in the Senate and influence government policy. Are you comfortable with that? Well, I've made the point um, numerous times that we're saying to the Australian people, vote first, Liberal and National Party. Now, when it comes to Clive Palmer and his preferences, the Labor Party chased them. They're now preferencing Clive Palmer in 85 seats, including putting them second on the ballot paper in Frank in Franklin and third on the ballot paper in Petrie. The Labor Party have been caught out on this. Chris Bowen on Q&A the other day had nowhere to hide when he accepted that the Labor Party had been preferencing the UAP ahead of the Liberals. OK, if you get elected, clearly your first priority is to get these tax cuts legislated. Yes. What then? What's next? Well, obviously, this is a, a major package of reform. Yes. Uh, the Labor Party have said that they're against it. We put in the budget a whole series of changes around um, infrastructure spending, uh, in essential services. There's going to be legislation required on a whole host of areas, but in relation to tax cuts, that's going to be our sure, first That's your priority, but then what? Priority. then what? What's next? Well, the budget sets out our plan for the next decade. It's infrastructure spending. It's tax cuts. But that's the normal stuff. That's the normal stuff of government. What, what else have you got in mind for the country beyond tax cuts? Well, a hundred billion dollars worth of infrastructure. Yeah, but that's spending, what people expect. Of, you know, that's budgets come along every year. What is it that the, that the that your party has? What's the vision well, beyond tax cuts? Well, I'll tell you what the vision is, and it's in three parts, and it was spelled out in the budget. The first is re fiscal responsibility. Uh, we have put down the first budget surplus in more than a decade. That's not insubstantial given that Australia is paying $18 billion a year in interest, enough which would pay for 500 new schools to be built every year or a new teaching hospital in every state. Secondly, it's how do we grow the economy when we're facing some of the headwinds, both domestically and internationally, and that is the apprentices, that is the tax cuts, that's the infrastructure spend. And then it's the guaranteed essential services, record funding on hospitals and schools, both increasing by more than 60%, three quarters of a billion dollars to mental health, treating and focusing on particularly young people and in Indigenous communities, support for our carers, listing more drugs on the PBS. And we're doing all of this, Barry, without increasing taxes. That's our economic plan for the next decade. Bill Shorten is going to see your house price go down, your rents go up. He's going to hit superannuants. He's going to hit retirees. He's going to hit income tax earners. He's going to be bad news for the country. But just finally, Peter Dutton said during the week that uh, win or lose, he's not interested in the leadership after the election. <laughs> What's your position? My position is I strongly support the Prime Minister. I think he's campaigned really strongly. Uh, he's shown great yeah, leadership. The Prime Minister well, the election? Well, we're focusing on winning this election. I'm focusing on today. I'm focusing on May the 18th and I'm looking forward uh, to a coalition victory and Prime Minister Scott Morrison retaining Thanks for joining us this morning. Appreciate it.